Hi, you've got Tina White and welcome to the Asheville View. I'm here today with Allison Scott of Campaign for Southern Equality, and we're here to talk about, you know, catch up on the uh, situation in the LGBTQ community in the South and in Western North Carolina in particular. Allison, welcome. How are you? Hey, Tina. Uh, it's, uh, I'm doing as well as I can be expected. It's a weird time. And for those who don't know, we actually live about three blocks away from each other. So we're, but we're speaking library to library. We'll have to compare books. Uh, so, so tell us just a quick introduction about Campaign for Southern Equality and, uh, and your role. Yeah, um, well, the Campaign for Southern Equality has uh, been around since 2011. We work for the lived and legal equality of LGBTQ Southerners. Um, we've got a lot of missions. Uh, it's it's kind of unique. I think a lot of organizations are very focused on just one or two things, but when we say the lived and legal equality, that can manifest itself in different programs. So our programming really, really varies depending on what we're working on. I'm the director of policy and programs there. Um, been there for two years now. Uh, it's been great. I, I love it. I've worked with uh, CSC off and on for a few years now, so is was it the biggest transition for me, but it was definitely a pleasant one. And yeah, one of the things I do is I'm kind of in a little bit of everything, uh, being over policy and programs, and also we're not exactly the biggest outfit in the world, so I think everybody there has to have a have their uh, hands in a little bit of everything if we're going to get everything done. So, Allison, I know one of the one of the things you're doing right now is a, a COVID relief fund. Can you tell us about that, how, what its purpose is, and then how it's going right now? Yeah, well, our COVID-19 relief fund really morphed out of the Southern Equality Fund. We've been giving out grants for the last five years uh, with our Southern Equality Fund to LGBTQ Southerners, uh, and those could be grassroots grants or uh, individual or grants to organizations and groups. But with COVID-19, I think like most organizations, uh, we realized that there was just this need to reassess what we were doing and how we were doing it. And one of the biggest needs we saw were individual needs. Uh, people, uh, you know, most studies I've seen show that every 40% of people under 50 years old are out of work. Uh, we know especially LGBTQ people tend to make up a lot of the percentages normally, uh, even a higher percentage of people who are unemployed or struggling with employment. Uh, so we knew our community would be some of the most affected. And so what we did is we decided to restructure the funds slightly and put a priority on individual grants. Uh, we've done that, but it never really been advertised. So with COVID-19, we took this as a, as a new way of helping our community and helping individuals specifically with uh, $100 grants. So that's what we started. And we started that, uh, you know, I guess it was in March and it was a, uh, it was pretty phenomenal. We, we had a lot of response. Our first grant round uh, was a uh, hundred grants and it, it just was uh, overwhelmed in, in just a, like 24 hours. And so we saw there was a need. We went back, we opened up another grant round and every time it got shorter and shorter. And the last few grant rounds uh, have went, have basically exhausted all their funding in a matter of hours, um, which is, speaks to the seriousness of the situation that's going on. And also that we're able to get that money out. That, so we're really happy that we're able to help people. And those are people all across the South, even though we are based in Asheville, we have an office in Greenville, South Carolina, and we have employees in quite a few states. Um, so our, our Southern Equality Fund and all of our programs really stretch all across the South. You told me before that uh, you were telling me about some of the stories that, that people would write when they were applying. Can you share, you know, a couple, what, what is it, what are you hearing out there about people's straights? Well, it's mostly exactly what we expect, that people are out of work, uh, lost their jobs, or if they've even been lucky enough to have a job. Again, I just can't stress that enough. So many LGBTQ people have been unemployed before this started. It wasn't like our community was exactly riding high on the prosperity of a lot of other communities that they felt. But with COVID-19, it took it to a new level, and people are in need of very basic things, 
food, um, you know, medicines. It's just those things that you absolutely need in life and they don't have access to either through because they were not employed in a situation where they could get unemployment. Um, maybe they weren't employed or they just have another reason why the system has not met their needs. So a lot of the stories we're getting back are, are very personal in nature and people saying, you know, hey, this check, you know, this money arrived just in time, my rent was due, or this money arrived just in time, we've been needing to buy groceries or we've been needing to buy medicine. So it's gut-wrenching. Um, when you hear those stories in the very personal, it puts it in the, a very real light. Um, and I think it just brings home the seriousness of the situation for all of us at CSE. Where do the funds come from? Do you have many people donating to the fund and are you still taking donations? Yeah, we are still taking donations and they come from uh, private sector individuals all the way up to foundations. We've been very fortunate. Uh, last couple of years, we've typically given out uh, around $80,000 and always one of our big milestones was to hit 100,000. And I think one of the greatest things about uh, this COVID-19 response fund that we put out is people have seen the impact and how we've been rapidly able to distribute these funds. So we've gotten um, very, very generous donations from some individuals and a couple of foundations now. And so within the next month, we're actually going to hit the $200,000 mark that we will have distributed. Wow. For just the COVID fund? Uh, well, that's for, we count for our Southern Quality Fund, so that would be some of the funds that were pre, previous to that, but to give you an idea, uh, we've already given out $85,000, I mean, that's checks sent out this year, and uh, we had a round last week, and within 20, a little over 24 hours, that round ended, and that one round was $65,000, 55000 of that was to individuals, so it's $100 increments. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So turning from the fund itself, just to your, your experience either with your organization, how have you guys been affected by COVID as an organization and as a 501c3? Well, it's, it's been, you know, it's, I think, especially for LGBTQ organizations or any minority um, uh, organizations that are nonprofits that are working in these kind of philanthropic sectors, I think they are made up of the very people that we're trying to help. So we see it even in our own staff, you know, the challenges of this time of working remotely, of losing community and connection, which is especially, I think, important. It's important for everyone and especially important for LGBTQ people. So we talk about that as a staff, uh, you know, sometimes daily. We have weekly chats and we have office hour mixers where we try to just get on with each other and, keep our spirits up and um, but you see it you know we're a microcosm of this whole community of the challenges the successes uh, everything with it and it's hard it's hard to see it in your coworkers. it puts it definitely puts a face on it um, you know we are working remotely we we've got uh, employees in a, in a couple of states so we've always had some component of remote work but with this you know now everyone's home is their office so not getting to see people has uh, made us shift the way we work and again presents us challenges of not being in, in community with each other in a personal way. I've wondered in, in times of crisis, the crisis can either drive people into their kind of segregated communities, whatever that may mean, LGBTQ, people of color, um, people of privilege. It can also drive them together um, to work more closely on issues. Have you had any sense of, how, how do you feel Asheville and Western North Carolina are responding to the crisis as a community? I, I personally, I see a lot of success stories. Uh, one of the things we do in our grant making is we also have frontline grants to organizations who are doing frontline work. And we, what we mean by that is the people right on the frontline, helping those in direct need with, clothing, home, you know, uh, food situations, anything they need just to get them through day to day. And we are seeing a lot of that right here in Western North Carolina. I think uh, Beloved is, it's one of my personal favorites. I think they're just a model of um, how to do caring and healing and uh, just really powerful work. 
uh, for everyone, and it's something that we're able to see here in Western North Carolina. They are also one of the people we've given a frontline grant to, um, just because they're doing some work that you know we as an organization we can't do. We're not set up to do uh, direct relief to people in a non-monetary way. So you know to see them uh, them come together, and then I think. Asheville and Western North Carolina has also gotten behind Beloved. I've seen a lot of organizations uplifting their work. And I think that's one of the most powerful things right now is to see the way as organizations we're supporting each other. It's like, hey, this isn't our strength, but this is our strength. And here's how we can help you with your strength by applying that. Um, and it's just nice to see that. It really is. It gives me, it gives me something positive to look forward to in this really challenging time. When we put COVID behind us or reduce its, its focus in our lives, what are the one to two things that CSE is most focused on or your top priorities for the balance of 2020 other than COVID addressing COVID issues? That's the, that's the challenging question. If you'd asked me four months ago, our priorities and programs uh, look considerably different. So we have shifted. Um, initially, we took that as anything that wasn't COVID-related, we uh, just pulled back on until we could get our feet under us and realize that there was this new need that we need to address. And here in the last few days, we've actually been, you know, a week or so, we've been talking about what does the rest of this year look like? It's difficult because you have to make some assumptions. Um, you know, we have to run two or three scenarios that, maybe COVID will be a part of our world just ongoing and what would that look like <clears throat> or what is a resurgence and <clears throat> of it look like if it comes back in a really difficult way um, on, a, on a community level and those programs like voter registration you cannot do those in any way but person to person with filling out forms you can do webinars but I think we're seeing the challenges of that, like a lot of groups, that people are burning out. Uh, you know, this, this Zoom world is has has a toll on people. There's only so much screen time that people can take. And then you have the challenges of where the laws meet that. You can't virtually register people to vote. Um, you can only instruct them how they can do it. And that process dramatically changes if they have to do mail-in ballots and then you have to go through the assumptions of course if they even have an address to mail it to you which gets us into right. uh, something totally different we're also working on um, some of our legal issues that and legal challenges um, across the across the southeast those haven't changed much other than being delayed because of the court system's uh, response to COVID-19 and anything that's not pressing has been put on the back burner but those will be opening back up. So we will be pursuing those again, um, you know, in the, the rest of this year. And in North Carolina, that one of the things would be conversion therapy. Uh, we will be starting that back up again toward the end of the year. So, and also our school systems work. Uh, we're currently working with um, the school systems in North Carolina right now to help with some of their, um, their systems and the way they address students and the way they, um, have to use legal names for students in their in their academic life and we're trying to work with them on uh, hopefully something will get changed by the end of the year which will help the school systems. What would be the one or two things that you would most like someone watching this to do to take action on again uh, in between now and the end of the year what, what do you think it's most important for citizens uh, who care about rights and and a i forget how you put it but but a quality lived equally lived experience i don't think you, you put it more elegantly than that um uh what is, what would be the shout out to the community that you'd have well i'm i think of myself as a positive person um and so if I was going to offer advice, unsolicited advice, I would say treat people kindly. Um, it's, it can be more challenging and difficult times to keep an open mind to hearing people you disagree with, uh, to hearing organizations you disagree with or government agencies, anything. But I believe, and, you know, at CSE, it's one of our driving tenets that, you know, empathic, 
uh, being with empathy with people and seeing the humanity in people is the key to every every battle that we face that if we don't start it from a place of empathy um we probably are not gonna win and we're not gonna get the results that we are looking for in the long run which is that lived in legal equality that we we so much strive for right so i think just you know talking with people um you know not dismissing and shouting out and i know that sounds really touchy-feely and i guess i'm a touchy-feely person though because i really am big on having empathy for other people. Um, and you can still resist. It doesn't mean not resisting being passive. It just means starting it from a place of empathy and learning what these really cool organizations are doing. I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we're doing at CSE and I'm so proud of these other organizations such as Beloved, such as WinCap. So if you're here in the Asheville area, you know, um, these organizations that are doing some direct hands-on relief work. They're amazing. They really are. Find out what they're doing. See if you can get involved. Some of them do need volunteers. Some of them need monetary backing. Um, but just finding out what all the positives that are going on in the community and not getting bogged down in all the negatives, I think that's one of the most, the most beautiful things about the LGBTQ community. I think we are so resilient. And I think we have a natural tendency to just keep clawing and keep fighting away. And we just keep emerging out of difficult times. And to me, this is just another difficult time, and we're going to come out of this stronger than ever. Well, that's a great note to end the interview on. I thank you so much for your time. And well, thank you. All right. Thank you very much.